sessions go? Good? Yay. Well, you should be clapping yourselves because you've done them and the energy in them is fantastic. So thank you so much. Um, let's all grab our seats. Thank you. We've got a great session now because we're going to be joined by some climate leaders and Mr. Gore. And it's really a chance for us to put ourselves into their shoes and listen to their real experiences of yeah, how are you? what they do after their training. Because the trainings are always fantastic, but you walk out of here and then you're sort of alone or you've got a small network and away you go. So it's a great session to just have a listen to what people have been able to do, how they've gone about their work, and no doubt Mr. Gore will share some stories as well. So I'd like you to join with me. Let's welcome the leaders onto the stage. Could I first bring up Laura Tucker? <laughs> Laura was trained in, uh, Laura, San Francisco? Yes. 2012. Um, can I welcome Laura? Could I bring up Steve Richard? Um, come on up, Steve. Welcome, Steve. Steve was trained in Miami uh, in 2015. <laughs> Wrong coast. Uh, let me bring up Belinda Chin. Mm. Belinda, come on up. <laughs> and Belinda was trained, Belinda, it's Denver just recently. So Belinda's a recent trainee this year in Denver. Um, and let me bring up Ken Lambs. <laughs> Ken, come on up. <laughs> and Ken was trained in Chicago. 2013. And of course, could I warmly welcome Al Gore back to the stage. Thank, thank you again, Don. Thank you again. All right. Don and I are going to be working together in Australia two weeks from now. A lot of, lot of exciting stuff underway there. Well, thank you all very much for taking part in this panel discussion. All these uh, folks have been through this three-day experience, just a couple more sessions to go now. And I thought uh, that it would be of interest to them to hear about your experiences, having gone through the training and having gone out into your communities uh, and given the slideshow and undertaken acts of leadership and work to build uh, support for solving the climate crisis. And I really... Uh, appreciate your willingness to come and share some of your uh, experiences. Um, first of all, let me just start. We'll go that way uh, from there down. Tell us, what's your story? Uh, well, I, I think what really start, galvanized my um, interest in the environmental movement uh, was the first Earth Day. I was young, so in high school, but it was a pretty powerful moment. But a few years later, I was in college, and my professors were all preaching doom and gloom. We mm. were all going to die in a nuclear attack, some horrible disaster. And I was studying to be a wildlife biologist, and I thought the way to manage that was I was going to go study a species that I respected, wolves, in the middle of nowhere until we died. So that was kind of where I was. <laughs> <laughs> Those professors were really effective <laughs> at terrifying me. Kind of an exotic variety of prepper. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And I was, you know, I was in a really deep state of despair. And I um, was competing for jobs with a lot of people with master's degrees I didn't have. I was working on internships. Took one as a last minute thing as a naturalist at an outdoor school teaching kids. Um, and they gave me hope. They could see through the stupidity. They had a vision for the future. And so much hope that another teacher and I started our own little nonprofit <laughs> that started a summer camp in an outdoor school. One of my former campers is actually here today, Carrie Gordon, who I've known since she was in eighth grade. She was here in Seattle, and she's not in eighth grade anymore. But um, that kind of takes me back to those years. And 15 years and 60,000 students went by, and was some of the happiest years of my life. Fast forward to 2011, we're in a deep state, of, I'm in a deep state of despair again because of the climate change issue. I'd written some curriculum 
for students on learning about climate change, and out of that curriculum came a group, student-led group called Students for Sustainability. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that two of them are in the front row. Um, and I felt like I came full circle. They gave me hope again. They did amazing things. They won the President's Environmental Youth Award from the EPA in 2013. Mm -hmm. Um, these two young ladies and eight of their colleagues are writing a bottle bill for the state of Washington. So just for FYI, you. Good for you. Washingtonians, um, if you get on their Facebook page, they just put up, it's called Five for the Future, Five Cent Deposit to Recycle materials that we're not recycling. And they're a student-run group. Their idea, they've got a, 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 one of our representatives ready to uh, introduce the bill in January. So you came to the training in San Francisco mm -hmm. back in 20, uh, 2012. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll come back to the experiences you've had since then, but what's your story? The trigger for me actually came from trying to be a good father. Uh -huh. I was on the way, I was in the car with my wife and two sons on the way home from Inconvenient Truth, mm. and uh, the car was totally silent, mm. and I thought, this could be a teaching moment. And, uh, what I really was thinking is I need to show them how to turn concern into action. Mm. And so I finally said, look, family, here's what we're gonna do. We are gonna cut our carbon footprint in half for our family in a year. Mm. And uh, we actually all high-fived in the car. <laughs> and uh, probably You were driving at the... I was, uh, <laughs> yeah, driving and high-fiving. There you go, all right. But uh, the energy in the car changed completely from being pretty low to excited. And um, a few months later, um, after we put solar panels on our, on our roof and a whole host of other things, I was with a friend and we thought, I wonder if we can inspire our neighbors and the rest of the community by posting our stories about what we had done at our wow. home on a website. And uh, long story short is that little website turned into one of the most prominent nonprofits in our community with programs for uh, climate action, waste reduction, greening our schools, local foods, and we've worked on hundreds of things over the past 10 years. Um, what I'm really excited about right now is just last summer, our town became one of the first in our area to join a community choice energy program that offers 100% renewable energy to every one of our residents. And our, just this spring, our county supervisors voted to join the same program. Wow, that's great. Congratulations. Yeah. Fantastic. So my story goes from trying to be a good dad to, you know, seeing ripple effects go across the county. Mm -hmm. And my takeaway from the whole thing is that uh, for any action that any of us take, uh, it can start a ripple effect like that. Fantastic. We'll come back to your experiences as a climate leader. Belinda, tell us about your story. What, what triggered me is the realization that hate has a carbon footprint. Huh. That's pretty heavy. Tell us what <laughs> you mean by that. Um, I'm the daughter of immigrants, uh, and my parents um, were forced off of it, forced out of their homelands. Their lands were taken and or ruined, so they couldn't make a living there. So they fled um, and eventually came to the United States. And little did they know that they were entering a land that was stolen, worked by stolen and enslaved people, mm. and informed by institutionalized racism and discrimination. They came with every expectation to be welcomed and were met with tolerance. They were tolerated and became invisible. Mm. So um, in, my, in, my, in the time and era that I grew up, um, there was a lot of war. Mm. And to be safe, to be not mistaken as the other or as the enemy, we drove everywhere because mm. it was not safe on public transportation, mm. nor was it safe to walk. Mm. So we drove. Mm. And so given that kind of um, 
that kind of uh, cli that kind of environment, um, you know, it makes you know I've reflected what what kept my parents going, and one of those mm. things was actually having access to their native foods. And as I think about it now, that was their connection to their homelands. Mm and also to the generations of people who lifted them up, going all the way back mm. to the creation mm. when the ancient ones, the ancient elders who were our plants, the animals, they spoke with my ancestors and shared their love by helping them survive. Mm. And so to give hope to my to myself and my sister, they shared, my parents, you know, they made sure that we had access to our native foods. Mm. To share that love and that connection to the earth and to love. Mm. So over the years, um, we went through a lot of cars. Mm. Um, a lot of carbon was put out there and, um, and at the same time, my parents uh, also swallowed a lot of it mm. had an impact, reflecting on uh, yesterday's panel. It, it did come back to them. Um, I lost my father. Um, he died before retirement. Uh, his heart gave out. Mm. Um, and in my culture, um, you know, energy is supposed to freely flow through your body. Mm. And um, if there is a concern or a vulnerable place in your body, the energy can get captured and that's how illness happens. Mm. And so I think it's really interesting. I, I've reflected often about the fact that it affected my father and his heart. Mm. And then for my mother, um, she, she uh, passed away because of cancer that originated in her throat. Mm. Her voice had been stifled for so long and um, the cancer started there and metastasized throughout her body. Mm -hmm. So um, hate has a carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. And um, I do this work f for, for um, to honor my parents and my ancestors mm -hmm. and the, the ancient ones. And to do this work with love um, and um, and I, I, I also think of the babies now mm. and of their future and that I move forward with love. And it, um, a few years ago, uh, with that in mind, I uh, co-founded a chapter of the Environmental Professionals of Color. Uh, it's a program of the Center for Diversity and the Environment, mm. and that is to make sure that the heart that my father lost, that that heart mm. can be manifest in, in, the, in the babies now and moving forward, and mm. that my mother's voice grows mm. in, in, the, in the professionals to be. Mm. And, and to be part of this and to save, to, to save ourselves and to save the earth. Mm. What a beautiful story. Thank you. I, I appreciate you sharing that. I'm, I'm so sorry uh, about the losses you've suffered and the pain your family endured, but you are in a welcoming place now, and we're very, very grateful to you for what you're doing. So, um, <clears throat> what's your story? My story after that. Um, yeah, you've got a hard act to, a hard uh, act to, follow, to follow there. Thanks, Belinda. <laughs> Thanks. Um, when I was in medical school, I got involved in anti-nuclear activities. Um, and when I finished, I got involved in helping form uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility. Great organization. Um, Great organization. Thank you. And I spent quite a few years um, talking to people about nuclear war and nuclear weapons and about the, the health dangers of the nuclear arms race. And after 15 years of doing that and other conservation activities, I sort of dropped out onto the sidelines for almost 20 years and, and didn't do anything active. Although I was concerned about the environment, I wasn't involved in doing anything. Until one night about 
a little over four years ago, I was at dinner with some people, and one of the people at the table said, you know, climate change is a hoax. And I just sort of looked at him, and I tried to do what I could to, to rebut him. Mm. But then he started talking about hockey sticks and East mm. Anglia, and I just did not have the, mm. the tools to, to talk to him mm. and, and to answer him. So being a doctor, I wanted to know what I was talking about and went home and started to read about climate change. And a couple of weeks later, happened to be at a uh, morning coffee at my son's um, middle school for parents. And there was a dad there who had a uh, badge on about uh, stopping coal. And that was Michael Foster, who many of you know, who's a mentor here. <laughs> and uh, Michael told me about the Climate Reality Project. Mm. And I signed up and went to Chicago a couple months later, did the training. Um, came back to Seattle and found out that the Washington chapter of Physicians for Social Responsibility, we've got eight people here, um, had started to take climate change as one of their main oh, focuses. That's so and so yeah. that's my involvement now is looking at the health impacts of climate change. That's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, wonderful, wonderful stories. So um, we know a little bit about who you guys are and what you've uh, experienced in life and your journey thus far. What, has, uh, what have your experiences been like in going out and giving the slideshow, talking with people, uh, trying to uh, build this uh, consensus? Uh, anybody who wants to go first, feel free. Sure, I guess um, the main thing that I've been surprised by is, is how supportive and appreciative people have been. Uh, I didn't expect that you sort of hear everybody talking about deniers and you have your fears and I was just surprised how many people came up after presentations and said thank you that was great I haven't seen something like that and and um, just the appreciation and the support mm. I guess part of it's being in the Bay Area <laughs> but uh, that was a surprise to me yeah. and, uh, it, it propels you further when you feel uh, that kind of feedback yeah um, I've been a, a, a teacher my whole life, so trying to share information in a way that's accessible is something that I've done. But this is a new audience, and I came away from the 2012 training completely energized, and plus your slides are fabulous. I mean, it, I've learned so much from the project, but I've also really learned how to do excellent slideshows with great animation okay. that are interesting, so that the slides are the visual part. You, you know, it's not so much the presenter. So that empowered me to have this great body of knowledge uh, can put together in a really intelligible way, interesting, intelligible way. And then I did find a lot of folks that were very interested in hearing that are coming up to you saying, I can now explain to my brother-in-law in Oklahoma why this is an issue. Mm. And I always ask for feedback, though, at the end of all of my presentations. How was it? Sometimes it was written, depending on how big the presentation was. Took a lot of feedback. My husband's been very helpful at giving me wonderful, constructive, honest feedback, and has helped my presentations a lot. So, but being a teacher too, you just you want to know how you can do it better each time. The additional slides in the deck that keep getting added to the Reality Hub have been very helpful too. Good, good, so, great. Well, but I'm ready you. to take the next step. To um, I made a connection with a leader at our pre-training uh, event a month ago. And I want to hit Eastern uh, Washington for a group that I'm not used to presenting to. Oh, so. well, good for you. Yeah, the, the connections uh, that people make here and the networking is one of the most valuable parts of this. And uh, the, climate, the, the, the climate hub is a good way to do that. What have your experiences been like, Belinda? I, um, it, it really uh, makes a difference to reflect on uh, one's own biases before trying to approach um, a new group, mm -hmm. and um, I think that moving along, one of the things that uh, I was trained from a, to have a knee-jerk reaction about, like when meeting new people, like to put on deficit goggles, and that actually is a barrier and is not helpful. And so, um, and now, hold on. When you say, uh, I'm learning new language from you. De deficit goggles mean that you look first of all for what deficits the person oh, has. Oh, okay. So, so in or terms of is this of, a budgetary term? <laughs> in, ter in terms of how I was socialized and, yeah. and in terms of how I was treated, 
um, people would assume that I didn't know things. Uh -huh. And so I, I adopted that. And um, well, Why would they assume you didn't know things? Because of um, being labeled as the other. Oh, OK. Or um, for, for people of color. For the vulnerable communities are impacted the most, and they have the least right. responsibility for having contributed to the cause. And okay, so, well, go ahead. I'm sorry. I just wanted to clarify. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so um, a lot of people make assumptions about why p certain communities are vulnerable, mm -hmm. and instead of respecting what people know about the earth or respecting that they may know something different about the earth and that it may contribute to the greater brain trust of solutions, looking at people through one's own social lens is, it can be a barrier. Hmm. And so that, that's what I mean, is, is that go in there expecting to learn rather hmm. than what can I teach mm -hmm these folks. And, and have your experiences, well, that's good, that's great. And uh, as you've given presentations, as you've uh, talked to people, uh, have, have you enjoyed those experiences? Oh, very much so, yeah. very much so, especially um, just broadening my own cultural uh, responsiveness and cultural competency. Um, uh, yes, I am a person of color, and um, I, you know I have my limitations in, in who I have access to, and um, and so, but uh, I watch what I lead with. I watch what I lead with, and um, I want to, you know, again lead with love because I want to work for the be the most good for the most people over the longest period of time. Right. Great. Great. Ken, what have your experiences been like? Um, one of the things I've, I've learned is that you're not in this alone. Hmm. You know, I thought I had to answer all that, the, the questions myself, you know, that one night at, at dinner. Um, but there's a huge community of people out there and getting involved with other organizations and other people, um, some of whom have different strengths than you do. Hmm. And coming together, we heard about that this morning with the Alliance for Jobs and Clean Energy bringing people together from, from various things, to, to me has been a really powerful way to approach this. Environmentalists coming together with labor people. It's not just jobs or the environment. It can be both. Um, working with communities of color, and that being an important part of the environmental movement now. Um, it, it's just been eye-opening for me to be able to have those experiences of being part of a broader movement and being able to be more powerful working with other people than, than I could be by myself. Great, great. So what's the most unusual experience that you have encountered in giving the slideshow or advocating? Yeah? My mother turned 80 last September and had a party, and she asked me to give the climate talk at her 80th party. <laughs> That's great. That's awesome. It was, uh, uh, so I was on the phone with her, and I, she literally wanted the, the full you know, projector, yeah. everything. And I said, Mom, I don't think your friends want to see the whole climate thing at your party. And she said, well, let's make it shorter, maybe 20 minutes. And I, I finally said, look, Mom, I'll give my personal story. I'll stand up after lunch, and I'll just give my personal story. And um, I was surprised because all of her friends were so engaged and asked more questions even than some of the presentations I've given. Huh. And it was kind of a liberating experience because I realized that just my story alone was enough to create interest and engagement and didn't need anything more. Well, that, that's great. That's great. Um, anybody else? Unusual experiences? Um, I'm not sure if this is a positive or a negative. I gave a presentation at a, a local public library, and afterwards one of the people came up to me and, and said, I'm a client, climate scientist, and why didn't you talk more about methane? Uh, you know, all the things I had brought up and talked yeah. about, but, but for her, I hadn't talked about methane yeah. quite enough. And um, so we've all got our niche and, um, and stuff, and there's only so much you can say as you know, in 45 minutes, yeah. as much as you try to get it all in. And yeah. uh, 
I, I thanked her for that and said I will try to cover it more in the future. And uh, yeah, well, we need to put together a short deck on methane, uh, so we can <laughs> go back to that okay. uh, library. Uh, did you have a? Uh, I'm I'm wrestling with one one situation that just comes to mind, and this was um, not a standard presentation. There's a a wonderful resource people can use if they like. It's called C-Roads, R-O-A-D-S. A professor from MIT put it together. I, I, I imagine you probably know of that. It's a simulation of what all the countries went through prior to Paris. So you can break your group up, high school group or adults, mm. into these groups, and then they negotiate and try to get the carbon footprint down and try to get the temperature down. And I borrowed um, one of our stellar teachers in town, Lois Sherwood's classroom, uh, her 10th graders, but the unusual part for me is I'm setting this up and it seemed pretty uplifting to me. I was teaching this to students before I worked with a group of teachers or a group of adults. And one student in the front row, and I don't even remember who she was, um, looked at me and said, do you really think we're going to make it? Yeah. And it kind of hit me pretty hard. And I'm being kind of upbeat. I said, hey, let's do this first and then tell me what you think afterwards. You know, it's sort of. And so the kids did this great. Um, activity and they got their the number down a little bit. I don't think that class was the one that saved the world. One of the three did. They got down to 1.7 degrees of warming through negotiations. But at the end, she said, I asked her, I said, so, so how do you feel now? And she said, I just don't know that we're going to make it. And I was paralyzed. I didn't know what to say to her. Mm. And I looked at her and I, you know, I could see myself reflected in her. Mm. And I said, you know, when I was your age, we stopped a war. We stopped the mm, Vietnam War. And mm. I said, it wasn't just kids. It was everybody that did it. And I said, that was the United States mostly. I go, we have a whole world yeah. that's working on this. And I don't know that I convinced her, but I convinced myself. Oh, no, well, good. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. And so did you want to share one, Belinda? We can move on if you don't. OK. So um, all these folks here have been through this experience, and they're getting ready to take what they've learned and go out and start convincing people and building communities of persuasion. Um, you can remember when you were in their position. What advice would each of you have for these new uh, climate leaders? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Think of your presentation from a poetry point of view. And what that stands for is, because um, putting together the slide deck, especially after seeing yours, like it's you know, overwhelming. So um, thinking about poetry helped to help me organize and get it down to human scale. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so P is for purpose. So what's the purpose um, of, of the slideshow that you're putting together? Um, be organized. Mm -hmm. E is for elocution and to practice with your voice, the instrument of your voice, mm. and how you can capture people's attention. Um, P O E. <laughs> thematic. So, what's the point that you want people to walk away from? You know, after you get finished, what's the point? Mm -hmm. um, R is for relevance. So know your audience and what's important to them and start from there. And then why is you and to make sure that you are not a distraction and you're, you're, <laughs> you're, you're taking the attention from the content. So um, what I, an example of that is, um, this is going to, I took driver's ed and um, the instructor arrived at every single class with eye goop in his eye, and it was so distracting to try to pay attention. So check for eye goop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, yeah, and he never took care of it, I, and I ended up always bringing tissues with me, and get, like, here. Oh. <laughs> so wow. it was really hard to learn how to drive, like, looking at eye goop. So don't have eye goop, you know, check, you know. Don't make yourself a distraction. On the other hand, in my experience, um, what your audiences will take away most is not just the information you're conveying, but also your feelings about it. Mm -hmm. uh, the same passion that convinced you to come and be a part of this is something you need to hold on to and, and communicate 
the, the, the feeling of enthusiasm and passion. That, that's really uh, a powerful message in and of itself. But advice for new climate leaders. Yeah, just following up on that, I would say bring yourself to your presentations and what you do. And by that is figure out what you want to say, but who you are and what your strengths are. Now, I'm a science person. I have a science background. <laughs> I can spout facts and figures all the time, but that's not what connects with people that you're talking to or your audience. Um, the story is really important. The story that you tell and the connections that you make. I start off my presentations talking about my son, Michael, who's 17. Um, and, and that's the connection that I make as far as a personal thing. And I finish my presentation bringing Michael back mm -hmm. into the story. But, but make it personal. Find out what about the presentation works for you, what you're comfortable with. You know, you're not just up there giving the slides, you're making it your own. So figure out a way to, to make it your own so right. it really feels special to you. Great, great advice. Yeah. I'm going to add on to that. I, I think one of the advice, one of the things I sort of walked away from my experience was when I left my training in Miami, I literally wanted to go home, find a big venue, and be you. To, 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 I, I wanted to give the presentation as like you do, and it, it's impossible. Um, I try, but um, so I, I really also learned, felt over time that you know we have our own stories, we have our own passions, uh, personalities, and we when we utilize those, then we make our acts of leadership our own, and that's something I learned. One just fun example was. Um, I think it was last summer, I'm a, I'm a hiking nut. So I contacted our local hiking group, and I said, hey, what about putting together some climate hikes? And um, then I can kind of you know, integrate. I can be myself, yeah. in a sense, and made all the same points that are in the presentation with two packs full of props and signs on my back oh, on, wow. a, on a two, three hour hikes. And that was great, because it was me. And yeah. It, yeah, that's, I bet they really loved that. They did, and you can have a lot of conversations <laughs> while you're hiking. <laughs> yeah, well, that's great. Laura, what advice would you have for new leaders? Well, being, being the teacher, I'm, I, practical information is, is sort of comes to mind, but um, what I really appreciated after coming out of the 2012 training is all the people that I met at my table, and we shared emails and got in touch with one another, so we were sort of supporting each other as we tried different audiences, different styles, things like that, so that was really helpful. Your mentor is also going to be incredibly helpful because they've already had a fair amount of experience and if they don't know they'll find someone who does. Uh, the Reality Hub is an incredibly helpful place with information but it also tips on how to do presentations. Um, I appreciate that very much, the resources that you have there. And then it's, you know, just try, go small if that works for you, kind of play to your passions and your strengths. So I, I was asked to do a, a keynote for our little marine science center in our town, and that was pretty daunting, but it, I was mostly among friends, and so that was helpful, and a number of them came up and gave me lots of great suggestions in a, in a loving, wonderful way, but I changed my presentation markedly after that. Oh, great. So, um, you know, start, start small or big, whatever works for you. And um, What kind of practice audiences did you guys use? You have family members, loved ones? Uh, people who you could get to sit still to let you practice? I, I dove in the pool. It was the Marine Science Center's keynote. Oh, good for that you. That was my okay. first presentation. Yeah. All right. I, I, I was actually invited over to another climate reality leader's home uh, to do a dry run, and he had filled his living room with 15 chairs with stuffed animals. Oh, come on. Oh, <laughs> oh, that's and, uh, great. It was, uh, that was great. I wish I'd and, tried and, that and, first. And uh, it made me realize that uh, I, was, I was probably being too... I've got that mental picture. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it, it's hard to be too serious when you're looking at stuffed animals. So it helped me uh, relax and not, uh, you know, have a little fun with this. And not, and not to be too serious. And then uh, the other thing for, my, for me was uh, practicing at home in our family room with my wife. And it was, it, it was funny because I kept trying to coax her back into the family room. Yeah. Like, come on, dear. Come. come you were come, losing your audience. Come, come see it again. And 
<laughs> she finally said, I cannot see that presentation one more time. Aww. And I, I knew I was ready then. <laughs> <laughs> and what about you guys? I practiced in front of uh, some peers. Yeah. And that's how I learned that I have a high um count. Oh. So I needed to decrease that. Ah. And not to touch my hair so often. Oh, okay. yeah. And. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. oh, that's great. There that's we go. Great. There we go. But yeah, so so no, ticks ahead. too. There, there, there's also you know just like funny funny ticks kind of thing. Yeah. So it was great. So yeah. tried to calm them down, but now I've had re I've regressed. No, no, no. You're doing great. Go ahead. Three days after the trading in Chicago, I went on a 12-day raft trip in the Grand Canyon, uh -huh. which was wonderful. Anybody who's never been yeah, there, that's it's great. Yeah. It's, um, and I was on rafts every day with three or four people, and they'd be stuck with me for the whole day. <laughs> I, was, I was, was fresh off the training, and I had a captive audience, and I just uh, I went through it, and I would tell them things that I could remember. And uh, <laughs> that's so. great. But it was it was a small group at a time, so it made it easier. Oh, that's great. That is a wonderful experience too. Uh, yes. Yeah. Now you you talked about working with other climate leaders and using the Reality Hub. Have you guys also had the experience of working with other climate leaders and using the Reality Hub? Well, I'll just, I'll just start quickly. Yeah. We, we've been lucky here in Washington State, number one, to have Jill as our, our mentor and leader. But, you know, so we've, you're all now part of a bigger group and take advantage and it's wonderful because we've been able to lean on each other and take advantage We've had a retreat of leaders every year. We have monthly phone calls. Um, we can ask each other questions. And so I would say I've used the, the other leaders more than I've used Reality Hub. But okay. moving forward, I'm realizing the power that it has. And now that we have this many people, it's going to be crucial to, to connect with people yeah. that way. Just a brief comment before we uh, come to you. The um, Reality Hub, one of the values is I have found at least that um, timely recent examples mm -hmm. sometimes uh, grab people's attention a little bit more. Uh, and we try to post some, some more recent uh, examples of the different uh, advances in solar and wind, the different uh, climate related extreme weather events and so forth. Uh, so rea re the Reality Hub can be helpful, but I have heard from so many climate leaders that the, the, the work with mentors and the connection with others has been really valuable. You found that, Belinda? Oh, yes. Uh, I've been using the Reality Hub to contact folks, my peers in New York City, and we've been working on how to support um, climate leaders of color in this work, mm. to navigate the power grids and, um, and, and disparities. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, you have, did you ever get scared? Like now? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't believe you're scared uh, now. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's one thing presenting in front of a, a raft. It's another thing to be in front of 800 people sitting next to Mr. Gore, let me tell you. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you're, you're, doing, you're doing great. You're doing great. Go ahead. I was just going to add to Ken's comments about the, the, the regional groups. When I got back to the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, there was a regional meetup in San Francisco just two weeks later, and I thought that was a normal thing that was in every city across the country, and there were 50, 60 people there all from the Bay Area and, and uh, some from the training in Miami, and, and it was fantastic, and we've had those every other month uh, since then. And now I'm helping to organize them, but I've met so many people. We've collaborated. We've worked on events together. We've marched together. It's been an incredible community, and I would just encourage everybody to get involved in their in these chapters. Now, it's it's wonderful. Do you all feel like uh, the experience of being a climate leader has changed you in any way? <laughs> <laughs> Um, it has, uh, for, for me, at work, um, 
the Reality Hub in its own way has been like a source of professional development mm. um, in terms of the folks that I have access to now and the resources. It, it's been, uh, I, I feel very grateful for it. I, I feel so much more confident conveying accurate, interesting scientific information that, that also comes with a heart. I mean, it's the, the, the early mm. slides I got with this is the only planet that we will ever have and our children will ever have. Mm. And having been an environmental educator all my adult life, it is really, I mean, this is my focus. I mean, yeah. I, I have a day job and I do other wonderful things, but this is, this is really what needs to be done. And we need as many people on board to do as much as they can um, to get the job done. And so it's, I also love the connection on a planetary level mm. with 14,000 other people that have gone through leadership training and all the people that they connect to too. Yeah. So I feel like, I've always felt that I was a planetary citizen, but I feel like I have more access to that connection. And I draw a lot of strength from that, knowing that we're all working in this together. Yeah. You know, I just keep an eye on the picture there, the, the group photo of the Earth, you know, of all yeah. of us in there. Group well, photo, yeah. Actually, some, <laughs> some weren't born quite yet, but the group photo and, and um, yeah, it, I just feel like I'm really well supported and well connected through the project. Well, that's fantastic. And did you want to add something? Yeah, I would. Uh, it's it's absolutely changed me. The the I mean, my story going back to you know setting a goal for our family and then leading to this community effort. Um, it was my first experience with grassroots uh, activism and organizing, and and. Uh, it's been deeply rewarding because we, you, when you change your community, make it more sustainable, um, it teaches, the, teaches you that you can build the world that you want. I mean, if, if it's in your town or your county or whatever, you know, we were doing that and you, it makes you believe in that, whether it's your city or your country, uh, that you can band together and do it. Yeah. Uh, well, I want to thank each one of you personally for going through the training, for becoming climate leaders, for giving the slideshow, for being a part of this movement. Uh, I, I'm really grateful to you. I want to thank you for coming and sharing your experiences with these folks who have just gone through this training. And um, I want to ask uh, all of you to join me in thanking Belinda and Ken and Steve and Laura. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Belinda. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thanks Thank so, you much. so much. Well done.